So this is an example of different types of selection in terms of the advantages that different kinds of alleles can possibly give. Sometimes people confuse recessive and dominant with good and bad. And to begin with, there is no such thing as good or bad genes. Remember that it all depends on the environment you are, which changes over time. So what's good now could be changed tomorrow. So that's all dependent on the environment. You would think that, for example, the sickle cell gene would be a bad thing, but in certain environments, it actually gave an advantage. So that means that uh, selection pressure is important to see whether or not it's deleterious or advantageous. Either way, something recessive, it does not mean it's something bad. In fact, there's a lot of disorders which are dominant, like Huntington's disease and, and other, all kinds of deformity diseases. But sometimes diseases will be recessive as well. And in those cases, sometimes the dominant gene will protect you from having a disease. Like the hemophilia gene, for example, is a recessive value. So if you have one, the dominant, at least one, it's going to protect you from it. And that's what they're showing you on this pedigree here. If you're recessive, you die. But if you have any, at least one dominant gene, you should be okay. A lot of, of, of disorders are going to fit that criteria. Sometimes you also have disorders where the recessive LU will be protective. So this time they're shading the recessive trait, not the, the dominant trait. So if you have the recessive LU, at least one of them, that's going to give you a little bit of protection. But if you're just dominant, then you're going to die. And that's what they're trying to show you in this particular um, Punnett square here, or pedigree, where you have an F1 cross, basically. And so one of the four children is going to be uh, born with the recessive allele that's actually protective and it's going to survive. But the ones which are not, uh, they were all accidentally the 1 in 25 chance of having only homozygous dominant and they die because you, if you're like that, you're going to have the problems. All right, And then you also have these situations and you're going to have the heterozygotic advantage. And that's when yeah, the, being the hybrid is what gives you the advantage. And in this case, of course, the... Um, dominant or the recessive will both be selected against and then you get what's called balanced polymorphism where the entire population is going to be heterozygous and the alias will be fixed in a 50-50 ratio between the two of them and they will reach what we call a balance point between them. The, what, the balance point that the alias will reach will depend on a variety of factors including things like rotation rates, the types of selective pressure or, and, and other things like that. But in, that's something that we actually talk about when we do advanced genetics and try to study how to calculate the balance points in the population. And in advanced population genetics, we cover that. And I will do a video about that later. And so you can watch if you're interested in finding out how do we find out where the appropriate balance point depending on the kind of selective pressure that the alleles are under. Now, what you do need to know, though, is that depending on the kind of selective pressure, you're going to change the way that the that evolution is going to be take place. Now. So you're also going to have three kinds of selection in reference to how the selection pressure is applied. Now the first type they're showing you here on the top is going to be the disruptive selection. And the red line is the before, the blue line is the after. So as you see there was selection against the middle and towards the extremes. And that means extreme looks had an advantage over the middle look. A good example of this would be what happened with the Darwin finches in the Galapagos Islands. You know, they radiated from that common ancestor that had a mid intermediate look. And then everybody developed its own extreme look depending on the situation that they were under. And you have this disruptive selection. Now, of course, this might actually eventually lead to speciation if enough separation ends up occurring between the two groups that to the point that then maybe they become so intrinsically separated and then subsequently only group or have uh, babies with themselves and then this could all become a species and that could become another species. So sometimes this could lead to speciation, right? as it was the case with Darwin's finches. But in order for that to happen, you have to have isolation to separate the two groups because otherwise, every time uh, someone from one extreme meets someone from the other, you're going to continue to make the hybrids in the middle. You're never ever going to get rid of them and not enough separation will ever exist to actually differentiate between the species. But that is an example of directive sele disruptive selection is when you go away from the central balance look towards the extremes. Another type of selection would be the stabilizing selection. And that's when you have things like, for example, the heterozygotic advantage. And you have, it's better to be like the central look. So that's only one look is favored and it happens to be the look that hybridizes between the two extremes. So the hybrid has an advantage over either of the extremes and then you have therefore accumulation towards the balanced look. 
All right, so that's, for example, what we talked about in the sickle cell anemia example in the African populations because it provides them an advantage against malaria. And then there's also directional selection, and those have some, everything to do with uh, ha favoring either one or the other look. So in this case, they're favoring one end of the spectrum here. So, and that's when you go, for example, remember the moss example where the population shifts from uh, white to black because of the change in the pollution that existed in the environment. And so you had a shift in the population from the homozygous recessive to the dominant or vice versa because of the kind of selection that's actually taking place. So directional selection will change the population towards one end. Destructive selection will change the populations to both extremes and stabilizing selection will change the population towards the middle look. So I hope that makes sense and you understand the different kinds of directional selection. Now there's also here another graph that's trying to show you this and remember that a lot of populations will have what we call continuous variation or, or polymorphism usually caused by traits like multifactorial traits where you have a lot of different variations of a specific look but if certain looks are favored you're gonna get directional selection towards a look if two looks are favored or the extremes are favored you're gonna get disruptive selection and you're gonna get stabilizing selection if the evolved population favors a central or hybridized look. Now sometimes you also get something that's called oscillating selection. Now in oscillating selection what happens is that at, at, at one point uh, the selection will be directional to, war, to one end but then it will revert and select towards the other end but then it will revert and select towards the other end and then it will revert and do backwards and forth again. And that alternating pattern of selection towards one and the other land will, will cause a pattern that looks like a balanced polymorphism or, you know, uh, stabilizing selection, but it's really oscillating. An example of that is going to be the human height. And you see that every time the human height tends to get higher and higher over the ages because it is advantageous to be taller. So as you go through several generations of the human race, the population tends to get higher and higher. And so you, 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 get, you go from, a, from an area where people used to be a little shorter to you got to be a little taller and then be a little taller. So with generations, there's a tendency for a height to increase across generations. But then it gets to the point that we get so tall that the babies are usually going to be larger and they're going to be more likely to die during childbirth and also have more other problems uh, of growth and metabolic diseases. And so these secondary problems will put pressure towards the other end and then make the population shorter again. And then... But then they become too short and then the height becomes an advantage that's more important. So the selection shifts for a different direction. And so alternating patterns of selection will cause stabilization of the population. So if you say, you know, first you pollute the forest, then you clean the forest, and then you pollute it again and you clean it again, and then you pollute it again and you clean it again. What you end up having is when you're going to have members of the population in both colors because it's going to be unclear which one is going to be the most beneficial, and the population will keep fluctuating from one end to the other in microevolution. And that's called oscillating selection and I hope you learned a lot in the next video we're going to talk about types of mimicry which lead to frequency dependent selection so that's a very interesting topic and I hope you guys like it I'll see you guys then